So what exactly is a multi-species sward? Um, there, there, there's, there's essentially three parts to it. There's, there's the grass component, the legume component, and the, the herbs are sometimes called forbs. But the grass is there, as you might be familiar with, perennial ryegrass, but it's not just perennial ryegrass. It's also timothy, coxfoot, and festulolium. Festulolium, by the way, is just a cross, really, between fescue and lolium perenni, which is perennial ryegrass. The legumes, it's all of the, the familiar ones there. It's the red and white clover, uh, discern. Some of you might have experience of trying to grow it. Um, less familiar would be sandfoin, birds food trefoil. I have no direct experience of either of those two myself, but they would be on, they would be on the, the, maybe the periphery of, of uh, mainstream multi-species swords. And finally, the herbs, all important herbs. The main two so far that we have worked with and, and, and others have done research on um, are chicory and plantain. And again, two more that I'm not that familiar with so far uh, are yarrow and burnet. And they probably have less good persistency, those last two from what I read and understand as well. So the main two that we'll, we'll, we'll focus on tonight probably are the chicory and plantain. Again, just a couple of photographs just to get our eye in. If you haven't seen these sort of swords before, the photograph on the left is obviously a, a fairly freshly sewn out, uh, very um, dense and uniform population there of, of, I can see clover and I can see plantain and chicory. Again, just to get your eye in, the, the plantain plant leaves are the, the very pointy ones, the spear-like ones with veins or ribs, as the name would suggest, rib wart plantain, ribs running vertically, um, whereas the chicory are more of a round top leaf, a bit more like a lettuce leaf, with veins running laterally. That's the main difference there. Then that sward, you can hardly see any grass, but there is grass there. You just have to trust me. The photograph on the right is maybe a bit more typical of what some of us have experience of with um, getting grass, clover, herb mixtures established. The herbs in this case are a lot more dispersed and, and, and uh, uh, less of a population. So in one hand, that photograph could be just a different mixture. Um, but I think in reality, what that, mix, what that photograph represents, and it's not my own photograph, but um, it, it, it probably represents the sward on the left after a few years. Okay, so what I'm really trying to say there is that the because of the lack of persistency of um, some of the herb species, that's probably what you could end up with by maybe year three. Just uh, I'm sure making a making a story out of a picture there, but the grass, generally speaking, will be persistent. We can do grass in Ireland very well, um, and it will thrive in the sort of conditions that we have including all of the wheat grasses, by the way, but the herbs, maybe not so much. And again, we have to get used to the appearance of these swords. If you let your uh, multi-species sward go for a crop of hay or silage or haylage, this is what you're going to see. You can see at the top of that canopy there, if you look into the sky, you can see the very obvious um, slender seed heads of perennial ryegrass. There's some other meadow grass. I see the heads up there as well. But then looking down through the canopy, you can see lots of red clover, white clover, and there are some of the herbs in there as well, one or two of which I can't even identify. So it's, it's just these swords will look um, much more varied, a bit more messy. And another comment on, on that photograph could be that there's even um, a, 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 a a movement also, almost you could call it in England where they're looking at mob grazing of such swords. Let them get really high, almost like a jungle of, of, of a sward, and then go into a small area with cows and calves and actually graze it down very, very quickly within maybe half a day or a day. Um, so there's a lot of tramping involved. There's a lot of loss involved, utilizations out the window, um, but it's more to do with yeah, meeting the needs of the animals, but also trying to trump some carbon into the soil. That's a whole different subject, which some of the benefits, just to try and say, what are the positives 
um, of these types of swords. And this, there's a number of um, uh, organizations and research bodies across the UK um, and Ireland for that matter that are doing uh, really good work on multi-species swords. Rothamsted is one of them. Um, Ibers is doing work. Um, Dutchy College um, and the, the South of Ireland UCD and Chagas are, 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 are doing work as well. And AFB is, is getting going on it also. But the benefits that Rothamsted have put together are in front of you there. Um, there's opportunities with these swords to extend the grazing season. There's increased productivity. They're more resilient. And that's a key word. More resilient under extremes. By extremes, I mean um, after uh, periods of heavy rain or um, periods of drought, for that matter. Um, the greater availability of micronutrients, that's basically down to the deeper, and uh, more, more investigative rooting that these plants have down into the soil root zone. Improved soil quality and carbon sequestration, um, which we've already touched on there briefly. Um, reduced need for fertilizer and nitrogen, that's largely due to the legume component in the sward. It's not that these, these multi-species swards um, can do without nitrogen. Um, they are full of nitrogen, but it's fixed, atmospherically fixed nitrogen as opposed to artificial uh, sourced nitrogen. Um, enhanced parasite control, it's another key feature, and a very useful feature. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that later. And um, when you put all that together, you get enhanced sort of biodiversity of plant and organism life above and below ground. And um, th th there's been a, a lack of, um, up until now, a lack of work on studies of what's actually happening below the ground under these multi-species sword, swords. Um, so the, the uptake in Northern Ireland um, so far has been um, uh, small, is the way to put it. There's been a number of early adopters uh, right across the country who are, are, are keen uh, to, to try these swords from, from beef, sheep and dairy sectors. Um, there is, though, not many people maybe have them in the ground right now, but I, I've never seen um, such a wave of interest in something new in the sort of the grass area of, 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 of farming um, as this has generated a huge amount of interest um, from farmers and the industry in general about these swords for, for, the, for a whole host of different reasons. Um, there's a number of uh, multi-species sword research trials in the pipeline, one of which is EcoSward, and there's a shopping list of these, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to at the very, very end. Um, but EcoSward plots, we, we got those established down at Afby Gall in 2019. We also got, um, uh, through Ag Research with Super G funding, we got uh, some farmers um, supported to establish some swords. I think there's about seven farmers out there at the moment with um, some of these mixtures um, for evaluation as well. So at Loch Gaul, we're doing simulated grazing of monocultures and mixtures, and we'll, we'll compare and contrast that information, which you'll see some of in, in, in a few minutes, um, and we'll compare that and contrast that with the, the on-farm experience over the next couple of years. The research, by the way, is far and wide. Um, there's a lot of uh, work going on down under in both Australia and New Zealand. And in New Zealand in particular, it's a very dairy focused uh, country, as you know, but um, they are particularly interested in plantain, uh, sometimes growing it pure, um, as that photograph uh, would show in the center. Um, are some, more often growing it with ryegrass and clover. But you can see there, maybe in the small print in that paragraph, the plantain, um, even they recognize the plantain will only last two to three years under dairy grazing, which might surprise you and maybe think that's not very good. Um, but we have to think of strategies of how to replace that plantain then back into the grazing pasture without necessarily starting all over. Um, uh, in terms of overseeding methods and so on. The, some of the numbers on the right-hand side, is very small, apologies for that, but you can see there that the, in terms of dry matter, ME, crude protein, not dissimilar to ryegrass values, to be perfectly honest. Um, the the fibre levels are a bit different, but the main difference from any analyses of, of, of herbage that I have seen so far, including some that we took from Lord Gaul, <clears throat> 
in 2020 um, is the dry matter content because the, the leaves, as you can see at the top of that photograph, are, are, are fleshier, lower dry matter leaf at most times of the year um, when you compare to a perennial ryegrass leaf. Down south, um, they've done a lot of good work um, at UCD. Tommy Boland, uh, Professor Tommy Boland has led most of that work. And uh, the smart swords or smart grass systems, um, they investigated a whole range of different mixtures and different species com combinations, which was, was, was excellent. Appy, Appy was involved in that work, I should say. Um, but the key findings from that work um, over a number of years, um, mostly with sheep, I have to say, um, in terms of sustainability findings, as, uh, as I call them, um, there were less animal medicines required and less used. Um, there was a higher yield of herbage uh, with the multi-species swords with a lower amount of nitrogen input than the, uh, the control, which was a, a ryegrass-based sword. And third of all, um, the actual animal performance, the important bit, um, uh, is that there was a, a, a faster um, daily gain um, in, in, in lamb live weight, which translated into, uh, should translate into a higher profitability system. In terms of cattle performance, not as much in the literature. Um, we're, we're doing a fairly extensive literature review at the moment, but there's not nearly as much on cattle. Um, some of which, some work was done there in, in Massey in New Zealand, and they found 42% uh, uh, higher daily live weight gain in uh, calves grazing on multi-species versus grass clover um, back in 2015. But uh, there's not a consistency of that type of result because number one, we're dealing with uh, different circumstances, different, different climates, different weather patterns, different cattle and the multi-species swords themselves. There's no British or Irish or, or, or American standard multi-species swords. You, in all of these trials, you're dealing with slightly different combinations of species, which makes it tricky. The Diverse Forages Project at the University of Reading, um, as you can see there in the, the, the red chart in the center of the slide, and they compared perennial ryegrass, pure perennial ryegrass swords um, with three other types of multi-species swords. Didn't go into the detail of them, but you can see at a glance there, the, the average daily gain and the body weight uh, figures were similar um, for all of those multi-species mixtures compared to the ryegrass um, over 2018 and 2019. And I think that's a result in itself in that um, the perennial ryegrass, I think, in that trial was fertilized at about 250 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare over the growing season, whereas the herbal mixtures, three different ones there, um, got nothing. So, it, you know, for, for that degree of difference of, of, of nitrogen input to get the same amount of animal performance, I think, is a, a, a good result. But it's not all just about animal performance or sward performance even. Um, there are animal health benefits. And in terms of the, 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 the minerals, first of all, um, the literature is, is reasonably good on this. Um, and there are studies showing that, um, if I just go down through the slide quickly there, plantain, for example, has higher levels of calcium and cobalt. Uh, chicory has higher levels of magnesium and zinc. Um, so even just having those two species for a start off, um, you can um, maybe mitigate some of the problems of uh, stock getting low on either calcium or, mag or magnesium. So th th there's a, 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 a big positive, I think, from, from that feature of keeping the herbs and the sward for a start off. Um, last point down there, effect of the mineral content on the meat itself. Um, again, there's very little research on this, but some early studies have shown Rodriguez there as recently as 2020, um, no real difference in the actual meat, but maybe that is not such a huge surprise. So the second feature from the animal health point of view is the anthelmintic properties. And this has been fairly well communicated around the industry the, about these benefits, but it's good also that there's um, fairly solid literature cover um, as well to justify that. 
you can see there in those three examples of research studies with chicory and, and plantain again and even yarrow in the third piece of work there um, all reporting a, a reduced parasite burden and uh, in, in, in sheep and like I said at the top most of the studies so far have been done on sheep um, to date. It's not all about animals and, 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 and swords it's also about the environment and it's getting that, that, that balance um, but here you can see I'll skip to the right hand graph if you look at that one um, where it's about it's measuring the uh, amount of methane emitted per cow in terms of uh, relative to its dry matter intake and you can see at a glance the the yellow green and blue bars are the multi-species swords compared with the red bar which is the perennial ryegrass only treatment and you can see they're all uh, significantly lower than um, the ryegrass system in terms of the methane emissions from the animal from the point of view of nitrous oxide emissions N2O, you can see there the two blue bars, dark blue and light blue, are perennial ryegrass um, nitrate, sorry, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, and it, it, it's, it's not a shock to see that when you reduce from 300 kilograms of nitrogen to 150, that there's a massive drop off in nitrous oxide being emitted from the system. But the, the interesting result is when you look at a multi species sward. Uh, in that particular trial, at the same level of nitrogen, 150 level, there is another measurable drop. Um, I can't explain exactly what's going on in that whole uh, nitrogen cycle, but it's probably um, a fair bit to do with the, the uh, clover content for a start, um, but interesting nonetheless. At the same level of artificial nitrogen going on, there's less nitrous oxide emissions in the multi-species. Yeah, and also um, I hinted earlier on that there's, there's not as much to report as yet in terms of the soil health. And that is certainly something that is, well, it's kind of already here, but it's going to come at us even more in terms of managing our farming systems to respect and to um, uh, improve soil health generally speaking. There's um, a couple of places uh, across the water that have done some work on this, and it's preliminary findings only at this stage, but what they're showing, um, as no, no surprise, they're, the, the deeper rooting species can help to break up compacted soils, that would be a plus. Um, they're also able to store carbon deeper down into the soil profile. Again, it's just be largely because the roots are down there, and if you can keep those roots, uh, keep them there, first of all, and keep them healthy and keep them growing well, um, they will help to store carbon in the, the deeper into the soil. And the, the, the added benefit, again, is improved soil organic matter. Now, this is interesting. We do have a um, cattle grazing study on, on, on a couple of mixtures of multi-species sport at Hillsborough. Now, we only got it. It was sown out in 2019, so it was supposed to be fully on trial last year in 2020, but due to COVID and other problems, it, it, it didn't happen. Um, but the swords were there, and Chris Bowden, who's a student at Queen's, um, he was in doing PhD work with us, and um, what he was looking at was the, 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 the worm activity and the multi-species sward side by side with the, the ryegrass based sward um, next door. And I did this at AFB at Hillsborough last summer and also down at the, um, the site down the, the Devonish site in, in Douth, which is doing some uh, really terrific work with, with multi-species swards and uh, a whole carbon agenda going on down there. But <clears throat> in terms of the earthworms, I didn't even know about these different uh, categories of, of earthworms. There's, there's the ones that do the vertical burrowing deep down into the soil. There's ones that just dwell deep in the soil and stay there. And then there's the soil, uh, sorry, the surface active ones, which are probably responsible for all the, the worm casts that you would see on your lawn, for example. So they're all categorized. But what he found was, you can see it there in the second bullet point, the earthworms generally were, were much more abundant um, in, in and on and under 
the, the, the multi-species swards than, than a reseed or, or permanent pasture um, found at both locations. So that was, that was a pretty good find in, in, in his first year of studies, and he's going to repeat that. And what was interesting, these alisic or these, these very long, deep uh, burrowing type, type worms were more abundant in the, the multi-species swards and found that, again, very promising um, results, I'm quite jealous, um, uh, you find that at both locations, albeit this is preliminary results after one year, so you just be a wee bit cautious. But um, the last bullet point there is, so what, you know, the best answer whenever somebody tells you about a research finding is just say, so what? These anisic species um, contribute to hydraulic conductivity in the soil and the nutrient cycling, they're, they're constantly processing um, uh, dead and dying and decaying material down in the soil, adding to the organic matter and improving the soil structure. So th th there's nothing negative about all that. It's a, it's a, a really good piece of work uh, by Chris and uh, hopefully he can substantiate uh, more of those findings um, this, this summer um, when, he, when he gets to Get, get, gets going again. Um, another feature of his work that he's hoping to do this year at, uh, at Hillsborough is basically put these chambers down into the ground and look for any knock-on effects. Uh, okay, so there's more worms there under the multi-species swords, but what else are they doing? And there might be a knock-on effect to impact on the parasites that are present, not only in the sward, at the base of the sward, um, but in the soil itself. And some of those parasites will affect the animals. So there could be some interesting uh, additional uh, findings coming from that. In terms of the end product, um, this is not my area of uh, expertise, but just to report it, um, the multi-species swords containing plantain and chicory have been reported um, in some of the literature to have a higher proportion of these PUFAs or polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is a good thing when compared to grass clover swords. And that these improved level, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the improved levels of PUFAs have been found in lambs um, whenever they've been grazing on uh, trefoil, knapweed, plantain, red clover, selfing, and yarrow. So the, 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 full, the full card trick there. So that was kind of an overview of um, the benefits and some of the drawbacks and, and some of the realities of, of our experience of multi species swords to date. Uh, Jason did say at the top that we have actually got some plots on the ground, thank goodness, um, down at Log Gall to, to show people and to get some early results um, uh, on, on the table. And here we have the, the, the field, one of the fields down at Log Gall with the um, number one, the component species trial, and number two, the mixture comparison trial, which is really the Mixture A versus mixture B, similar to what we have out on some um, farm sites right now. But the process of the trial at Loch Gaul last summer, the little mini combine that you can see there called a Haldrop, um, it basically cuts these two meter plots um, every, eight, every, not every eight, weeks, um, eight times uh, throughout the growing season. And it's what we call simulated grazing. Okay, so that was the background to the trial. I'll just run through a few details quickly because I think it's important and it relates to some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, the establishment of that trial was sown into clean ground. All of that plant breeding, um, or the fields down there generally are, are turned over every three, three years or so. So they're, they're, they're pretty clean in terms of uh, docks and other you know, nasty broadleaf weeds. Inevitably, you will still get chickweed whenever you plow over a bit of ground and some, and some weed grass will come through, but quite clean from things like dogs. So that was important to, to note. They did get um, good clean ground um, at the start. Um, it was conventional ground preparation. By that I mean plow, cultivate, uh, roll before and roll after sowing. And when I say shallow drilled there, um, it's basically a specialist little uh, seed box, uh, the, the grass is really dropped rather than drilled. It's dropped and just tickled in with, with uh, um, spaced harrows. So the seed is kind of at or very close to the soil surface. Uh, fertilizer, um, importantly, 
um, all of the plots got about 80 kilograms of nitrogen in March, and that was it. That was it for the season. Um, the grass only plots within the trial got an additional top up of about 70 kilograms of nitrogen. And because of the very dry, prolonged, um, almost drought period that we had back in early 2020, ironically at the same time as the first lockdown, um, that um, the, 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 the grass, there was no point fertilizing any earlier than that because the grass just wasn't going to grow. Um, but late June, early July, normal conditions resumed and we put on the, the top up a wee bit late. Uh, later in the season than, than you would plan onto the grass only. Simulated grazing, like I say, was eight harvests, um, basically letting the sward get up to about 15 centimetres or so, and then uh, uh, harvest it down. Um, the, 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 those harvests ran through from the April through to October. Um, the average uh, uh, regrowth interval was about 26 days. Now that's important as well because uh, these swards generally you're not, you're not putting on a lot of nitrogen. Um, you're relying on clover doing the, 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 the engine work in the sward. And consequently, you kind of have to wait until the sward is ready to be grazed again. So that, that regrowth interval there at times was way over 26 days and other times it was under 26 days because you were just waiting for, for fluctuations and growth for the sward to get up to that, that 15 centimeters. And in terms of the season, like I've already said, there was a dry, cold, um, prolonged spring period um, with that um, almost drought conditions. And then um, from about July onwards, <clears throat> normal, normal conditions returned. Next slide. I keep going to hit the, hit the button. <laughs> um, so let's just see some of the, 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 the plots themselves. Um, like I said earlier, it's easy to, to well, relatively easy to, to, to establish and grow grass in, in, in Northern Ireland. And you can see on the left-hand side, that happened to be a tall fescue plot. It could, been, it could have been any of the grass-only plots. Um, equally, um, relatively easy to establish clover. And this was a plot of large-leaved white clover on the right-hand side. Plantain. Now, some of you may not be familiar with this, but this is the, 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 the pointy leaf, as I said earlier. And you, you can see that from the, the, the photograph, from the side on photograph on the left, and a slightly more overhead shot on the right hand side. Um, what I was particularly interested in this um, was because this was a replicated trial. So all three plots of, of plantain looked like this. Um, the, 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 the establishment that these, that all of that trial got was pretty hard in that they didn't go in until I think it was the first week of September. We weren't quite sure. We probably should have gone earlier, but we weren't quite sure what we were really doing with the multi-species wards at that time. Um, we just got them in and no more. There was a lot of wet weather afterwards. Where we're stood in that, in that left-hand photograph, there's quite a slope there, more slope than you, the photograph would suggest. And the, whenever I went down and visited the swards, in mid-December of, of 2019, there was wee rivers running road the whole way down across all of those trials. So they got a, quite a challenging uh, establishment first few months. But what surprised me was that that plantain plot there seems to work really well, even in um, a, a slightly challenging set of um, uh, establishment conditions and really dense. There was very little in the way of uh, weed grass invasion come into that plot as well, which I also think is noteworthy. Not such a good story on the pure chicory sward on plot on the left hand side. The 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 germination and the 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 the, the, the uniformity of the plot was not good. Um, uh, those plants that did establish did very well, but they just didn't the, as a population. In the plot, it just didn't get off to a good start. Um, there was a, a lot of um, weed grass invaded into the spaces in that particular plot. In fact, all three of the chicory plots were the same. And again, just another plot this time on the right-hand side of tall fescue. So you can see that, despite the the, the pretty difficult conditions that I keep talking about, um, uh, the the grasses generally can cope with that. 
but we just have to be careful, more careful, with the establishment conditions and timing and everything else um, for, for the, in particular. For so in terms of some results, um, this is purely uh, fresh weight yield and a bit like uh, Chris's study, it's, it's preliminary because it's one year. Um, so we're just getting indica indications from this, not firm conclusions. So starting at the left hand side, just ignore the blue bar for a moment, but the two dark green bars there that did very well. And here we go again, tonic and plantain. Sorry, tonic, plantain and commander chicory. So despite that chicory plot looking very sparse and had a fair bit of weed grass invasion and all of that, it looked ugly, but it performed very well in terms of those eight simulated grazing cuts right across the, the, the growing season. The bright yellow bars just nearby are all of the white clover uh, pure stands. Working your way across the two, got, uh, right in the middle, the two light green bars, Gosford and Ballantoy, two top performing perennial ryegrass plots. But at that very modest level of nitrogen and the fact that they missed out on um, the extra spring nitrogen that that kind of grass needs, um, only, only modest performance there. The two red bars are the Lemon and Discovery red clover varieties, which did very, very well also. Um, and then finishing off to the right hand side, all of the other, if you like, alternative um, grass only plots, which were just slightly under um, the level of yield of the perennial ryegrass. Our mix, for example, there is a mixture of different grass species with clover. Comer is pure Timothy. Barula is Coxfoot. Bardot is tall fescue. And Baraleaf is also tall fescue. So that's just those other types of grasses. If you come away over to the left hand side of the graph again, the bar finisher plot is interesting to me because it totally surprised me. It is a no grass mixture. It is just red clover, white clover, tonic, uh, uh, plantain and chicory. So what you're relying on there is clover, the engine, um, feeding the, the, the herbs and that, that particular sward, unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of it, but the, the, the sward itself looked very messy for most of the, the growing season, um, and I observed them closely. Um, but again, you just have to get used to that because what you had was clover uh, peaking at a certain time of year and delivering um, after the herbs had already delivered more so in the spring months. And because of the deep rooting, the, the combination of dry weather, and here we go again, we're, we're having a lot of dry weather at the moment, um, the combination of deep rooting, I think, was what contributed to that um, top performance the David of the... So the, the, the second part <clears throat> second part of the trial work down at Loch Gaul is the good old mixture A versus mixture B. I've deliberately put the detail up here to let you actually see some real life mixtures that we're using. Um, the one on the left, the mixture A, is, is, is a fairly conventional uh, perennial ryegrass white clover mix. And what we have in there, um, if, if you notice, um, is, is three late heading perennial ryegrasses, diploids and tetraploids, um, all, all top, top end varieties um, with crusader white clover. And on the right hand side, we've got the, it's only a subtle difference, but we literally substitute out some of the perennial ryegrass content and substitute in um, the 0.75 kilos of tonic and 0.5 kilos of commander chicory. But those small quantities are a bit deceiving in the sense that those are tiny, tiny seeds. So it's a bit like putting Timothy but like putting Timothy into a conventional grass mixture, it only takes a, a, a tiny quantity of by weight to add in a huge population of, of plants. Okay, and this is the same set of mixtures, by the way, that the, the seven farmers have out in their fields, more or less. Um, some, some of the farmers' mixtures have um, changed slightly. 
just some very quick results from that. Again, they're preliminary and they're, they're only fresh weight yields. Um, but you can see there that mixture B with the inclusion of the herbs was, was uh, dramatically um, uh, uh, more productive um, over the 2020 growing season, largely down to a combination of the conditions, the drought, the, the, the deeper rooting, um, and put all that together and you basically had a higher, more productive sward. And just to, to re-emphasize, it's, it's, it's the EcoSward project, yes, working with AgriSearch and working with the farmers, um, seven of those, different ranges of farm enterprise, sheep, beef, and dairy, um, different locations, different soil type. We established most of them in 2020, um, and we're still um, picking up um, experiences and we'll continue to um, from, from those folks in terms of their experience of establishment in early, early uh, years of the, the management of these swords. And also the ag research team are assessing with, with ourselves, assessing yield um, and uh, taking samples for, for laboratory analysis for the, the, um, uh, uh, the herbage feeding value and, and, and so on, crude protein, dry matters, and also the botanical composition. And that's critical. If we don't monitor um, the botanical composition on a regular basis, we won't be able to figure out which species are actually persisting uh, better or worse than others in the mixes. To, to, to bring this to a head and maybe get a little bit more practical for, for a short while here, um, which species are we actually going to include in these mixtures? And that's not an easy one to answer because there's such a variation of, of, of choice out there. Um, the basic eco-sward type mixture, like we've, we've just seen on the slides, is ryegrass, clover, chicory, and plantain. We didn't, we deliberately didn't go for the, 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 the 15, 16 species mixtures in those early, early days, um, because it's, it's about, I think it's about taking baby steps with this, because most people are familiar with, with, with ryegrass swords. Some have worked um, with ryegrass white clover swords, so we just wanted to take that a little step further by putting in the two, the two herbs, as opposed to adding in a whole range of legumes and a whole range of, uh, uh, of herbs at the outset. Maybe now and maybe next year, we will do some of those more complex mixtures, but from a research point of view and an early stage adopter point of view out in the farms, I think it's better just to uh, maybe um, creep before you walk you know, and, and all of that. Just make subtle changes to begin with. Um, in terms of other species, if you're maybe on heavier, uh, wetter, north facing fields, uh, Timothy is a good uh, extra grass choice to put in there and maybe maybe meadow fescue. If you're on, on, on better free draining soils, better sites, um, but maybe dry um, at certain critical times of year. Uh, Coxfoot is a consideration for a, a, an alternative grass to put in there, uh, and maybe lucerne, all with deeper rooting, red clover possibly, and also maybe sunfoin. But uh, the sunfoin we're, we're just not as familiar with uh, so far. Okay, next slide. This is probably one of the most frequently uh, used slides on any talks that I've seen or heard on multi-species swords because um, Cotswold seeds and, and fairness have a huge amount of experience with putting these mixtures together. But this just shows you the full range um, and some, some degree of specialization of the deeper rooting ones on the left-hand side for light soils and the, the, less, uh, the, 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 the more shallow rooting ones on the right-hand side for the heavier soil types. And you could maybe argue that that isn't necessarily always, the, always correct. But if you start over on the far left-hand side, you can see there the coxfoot as a, an alternative grass to, to perennial ryegrass has hugely deep rooting. You see there straight away. If you whiz over to the Cotswold Seeds logo over on the right-hand side, um, it's hiding the word ryegrass. And you can see above that, that ryegrass by comparison is relatively shallow rooting. And that's just the way it is. Um, back over to the left-hand side again, there's a whole host of different species there with really good deep rooting, including tall fescue, another alternative grass, um, lucerne, um, 
yarrow, sheep's parsley, and in the middle, the two herbs that we've talked a lot about tonight already, chicory and plantain, both have deep rooting. Both can open up soil and plantain maybe just has a slightly more carrot style root and the chicory is more of a, a, an adventitious type rooting um, going down through the root zone. Yeah, now this is a, a slide that I've photocopied out of a textbook um, which I used to use years ago. And it's really, I, I've just put this in, it's, it's a wee bit um, poor in terms of the, the, the photography there, apologies for that, but it's, it's just a cautionary note. When we start to talk about all these other grasses that we might put in um, alongside or maybe in place of perennial ryegrass, I just want to put the brakes on that a wee bit because in a lot of cases, there's a massive drop off in terms of quality in terms of feeding value. And you can see there, hopefully at a glance, this is the D value on the left-hand axis and the, 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 the fall off of the quality of the grass as you go through May and June in particular. And you see at the very top curves there, the white clover and the late perennial ryegrass, they keep their quality um, up, you know, above 75 D value all through May and only starts to tail off um, in mid-June for the late perennial ryegrass. You compare that, drop down to Coxford, it doesn't have as good D value to begin with and it drops off rapidly as you go down through uh, June especially, it's like ski slope, um, right down through June and July. So it's just a cautionary note. I and, and, and others might talk about Coxford, great for deep rooting, Great for a dry site, get it into a multi-species sward, you might regret it. It's, 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 a, it's a plant, and I have some direct experience of it myself, it's a plant that if you don't keep on top of it, um, it can become very hard, very tussocky, and um, you, you just have to be cautious with some of these alternative grasses, that's what I'm trying to say, and be realistic in terms of the reality of a chart like that, you are not going to get as good feeding value, but in a very dry site, it will be the best grass in terms of surviving drought. The Tom's project uh, is worth looking up online yourselves. Uh, work, very good work done by the Dutchie College. <coughs> and they have developed this Sward app, which is designed to try and help all of us um, put seed mixtures together. What they've done is along the top bar, you can see all the or some of the different species, not all. Um, and down the down the left hand side are the, the sort of the attributes of, of each of those. And the one that I picked out for attention tonight is persistence, which is the third one down on the left hand side. And the, it's, it's a traffic light system: green, green good, amber okay, and red not good. So you can see there for persistence, something like Coxford, hey, well, just just what we were talking about. Persistence of cox fruit is extremely good to the point that you might, you might have difficulty getting rid of it. Um, Timothy, not as not as persistent um, in, in the general um, mix of things, but chicory and plantain, bit of a disaster. Um, red light. Um, Jason splashed up a very good point there that um, I think the, the app, I haven't actually used it myself, um, is only available on Android at present, but I'm sure it's something that their 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 software people are working on. Yeah, I, I got um, working on an iPhone one, but it's not there yet. Yeah, and just looking at continue to look along the persistence chart there, you can see that um, other species that haven't got any information on our site clover, no surprise there. Bergsfoot's trefoil is only amber, um, red clover poor, sandpoint poor, white clover good. So there's no surprise in this, in the sense that um, we know that most of the grasses are going to be good uh, for, for, for persistence and white clover, but the Achilles heel with some of these herbs is the lack of persistence. But that doesn't mean to say we reject it out offhand and say, well, I'm not going to try that, thank you very much. Um, it's a matter of um, recognizing those other benefits that we talked about earlier, and then channel our energy in terms of research, in terms of on-farm experience, 
and learning from what other people are doing in other countries to see how we can improve on the persistence and maybe work up strategies that if the reality is that they're not going to be there after the third growing season, well, then we jolly well have to take action in the third growing season and get new seed planted back in. And there will be smart ways of doing that. Um, other features, just glancing down the left hand side, you, you can maybe look this up online yourselves, but there, there's some there that are much better for drought tolerance. Um, and for water and fermentic properties, maybe a quick look at that. You can see there that um, there's the flip side, cocksfoot, the grasses don't have any anthelmintic properties, but chicory is the outstanding one there for me and seems to be the best in terms of their ratings for anthelmintic properties for the animal's benefit. Another question is, well, there's so many species. If you look back at that, um, Cotswold seed uh, photograph. There's maybe 24 species on that on that chart. Um, which of these are we going to include? Um, well, the Tom's work again did, did some excellent comparisons, and they compared a six species, a 12, and an 18 species with a control, which was was ryegrass clover. Um, what they found um, was no difference in yield. And again, that doesn't really surprise me because once you put a whole lot of different species in, they can sometimes compete with each other for the same space, for the same time, whenever they peak in terms of the growth, and um, for, for, for nutrients down through the soil profile. Um, but what was interesting in that study um, was that the multi-species swards, generally speaking, whether it was 6, 12 or 18 uh, species in the sward, um, had much reduced weeds. And I think this is interesting because what's probably happening there is that because one species peaks and troughs, then another one peaks and troughs, there's very little opportunity throughout the whole growing season. If all of those species are there and doing their thing, um, there's very little opportunity for bare ground unless the sward gets badly tramped or damaged or, or, or mown off too close or something like that. Um, there's very little opportunity for the, the weed seeds that are definitely there, and they're always there in the surface of the soil, there's just less opportunity for them to germinate and get established. So if you do get your ground clean of docks, for example, this is, is, is a promising result for me anyway, it's encouraging um, that if we keep the multi-species dimension in the sward, um, it can help compete with the weeds. And there was a question flashed up there. I think there are no uh, herbicides available um, that I know of for um, controlling broadleaf weeds in a multi-species sward, mainly because the, it would take out the, the herbs and the clover probably. <clears throat> I will speed up a wee bit because <clears throat> we're probably losing time. Mixture performance on the left-hand side. <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> You can see that the, the, the ryegrass clover, the six species mix and the nine species mix, mix in Tommy Boland's work in UCD had similar yield overall to the perennial ryegrass control. Um, again, I think that sounds like an, a, a null result. I think it's a very positive result in the sense that the perennial ryegrass in, in Tommy's trial, I think had um, received 250 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare with zero nitrogen going on to all of those other mixes. So for them to be as competitive and, and, and as productive with no nitrogen is quite a, a, a positive result. So just to, 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 to get to a close here, I just wanted to finish off by looking some of the findings on uh, uh, different trials looking at how to establish these swords. We've talked about performance and all of those attributes, and we've talked about mixtures and how to, to figure out which species you need in your mixture. How do we actually get them established in the field? Um, did hint earlier as to how we had had a challenging um, conventional uh, sowing of the, the, the mixtures in the Law Gall trial. Um, work here in Wales and other parts of England have looked at conventional plowing, cultivating, harrowing, rolling, in comparison with on the right-hand side of the fence here, um, 
minimal tillage, I suppose I would call it, in the sense that there is basically everything but ploughing has been has been used there. Sometimes it's surface harrowing, sometimes it's light power harrowing, but some degree of soil disturbance after killing off the sward and then putting the seeds in directly. And again, the Tom's project in the Dutchy College, they looked at plough versus power harrow versus disc and then sow. And they found basically no difference um, from um, those three methods, no difference overall in the total annual dry matter yield of the sward that resulted. What they did find was that um, the sown species were more abundant and there was less broadleaf weeds such as dock and chickweed, et cetera, in the ploughed plots. And uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what to conclude from that. Um, some of the take home messages maybe from the research work um, in terms of establishment, uh, seed rates, again, the, the very useful Tom's project, um, there was no advantage that they could see um, in increasing the seed rate. It's something that is um, it puzzled me and I've, I've had plenty of requests about if we were just to increase the, the quantity of uh, herb seed in the mixture, would that not help sort out the persistence? Well, no, because the establishment is what it is and um, most of the plants might just end up intercompeting with each other if you put a lot more uh, herb seed in, in the first place. But they um, went from 14 to 21 kilos per acre of the same sort of mix and didn't make any difference for yield or weed suppression. So there you go. Um, in terms of sowing depth, um, I've hinted at it earlier, it's all about small seeds, get them um, positioned near to the surface, either on the surface or just into the first centimeter of, of soil. In terms of timing, earlier the better. I think we've all learned this. Um, there's no point leaving it until well, our traditional time for, for, for grass reseeding might have been, I don't know, mid, late August, perhaps, and early first half of September in a good year. Um, I think we probably need to go a month earlier. Um, in terms of weed control, you must get all your weed control done before. There's, there's just no opportunity for herbicides afterwards. Um, Steel seedbed technique, worth a mention here. Um, I know we, we talked and some of our uh, partner farmers, I think, did try it in 2020. Mixed results. We tried it ourselves um, in AFPE, and it's a good idea. It's a good concept. The, 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 the point is that you do all your cultivation. You have a nice, fine, firm seed bed as if you're about to sow the, 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 the mixture. But you don't. And you just sit back and you wait for a week or two for uh, a crop of weed seeds to germinate right on the surface. Just a little green beard of, of, um, uh, of seedlings, and that'll be weed grass, and it'll be um, maybe dock seedlings and certainly chickweed. Um, but you go in and you either burn that off or you lightly harrow it at the surface. And must be very, very light, otherwise you just bring up more seeds um, and then possibly do it one more time after that again, and then sow your mixture. What you're really trying to do there is exhaust some of the weed seed burden at the soil surface. The downside of all of that is that it takes so much time. And if you haven't started the cultivation uh, process early enough, you can quickly run out of time to get a good establishment of your target species. And again, just some of these same points again. Um, Conventional method of burning off and plowing seems to be the most effective, but it can be very site dependent. Um, and, I, and I hear that from farmers all the time. Um, broadcast or shallow drill. Um, hmm. I don't really mind as long as the small, the, 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 they're small seeds, as long as you end up with them sitting at or near the surface. I'm not really bothered what type of machine um, you use to do it. Rolling, you probably couldn't do enough rolling. The, the plot work that we did at Loch Gall, it certainly had at least two passes of the Cambridge roller um, to prepare the soil and get a really well consolidated, fine level seed surface, which probably stood to it. And then um, a couple of passes with the smooth, the, with the flat roller um, after sowing. 
oversowing of legumes and herbs into existing grass wards. This is maybe um, one of the strategies we might have to think about to try and get herbs back into a sward after maybe three years. Um, but to do that, you'd have to critically, you know, um, sort out any weeds that are that are that are persisting after that period. Let's say the herbs are gone, but you have um, replaced them with docks. You know, you have to do something with that before you think about putting more herbs in. Um, we also need to reduce the competition from the, the existing sward, namely the grass. Um, and sometimes options there would include do it after a fairly heavy silage cut where you've got a nice open white stubble um, or after a very close grazing maybe with sheep and continue sometimes to graze even after the seed has been um, uh, sown in uh, to help paddle the seed in first of all and second of all to reduce the competition from the existing grass which you have not um, sprayed off and then um, all being well get back into graze within 60, 68 weeks when all those, those small little seedlings have managed to just get enough root down so that they're not plucked out by the, the first grazing. So after all of that, um, what are the, 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 the knowledge gaps? Don't care whether you're a farmer or a researcher or a seed sales person or whatever. Um, the, the, there's lots of gaps in the agronomy, which keeps people like me occupied and busy. Um, the, the, the establishment we talked about, the weed control, the persistence, the, with a capital P, um, differences in nitrogen rates. If we start to talk to dairy farmers about grass plantain swords, what, what levels of nitrogen are we even going to do on those swords? Um, the lab analysis, Jason hinted at it there, we don't have NIRS analysis systems for multi-species swords. The equations just aren't there. So that's that's a vital piece of work that needs done urgently. Um, the defoliation intervals and heights, there, there, there's probably a reasonable amount of information there, but, and it's not just being selfish here, but I think a lot of it needs to be reproofed and, and re-shown um, on trials um, here in the North, just to, to, to convince ourselves and our industry that this is a, a worthwhile option. The seasonality of production, and there's another classic, the plate meter um, doesn't really work terribly well um, because we haven't got the right calibrations for the plate meter and the nature of the, the multi-species sward. You can see it in the photograph. That's one of the, the, the swards at Loch Gall, grass clover on the left. You can see the, almost see the dividing line and the herb mixture on the right-hand side. But the, uh, the, the plate meter, especially whenever the, the chicory plants, for example, start to become a little bit more um, erect and, and toppy in the canopy, um, the plate meter rests on those and gives you a false reading. Um, for silage, we need to do a lot of work there. Um, the, the timing and the method and the feeding value um, of such mixtures, um, we, we don't have the answers to that. In terms of the animal benefits, we need to look at all of those. The, the rooting characteristics, there's, there's a project submitted that you'll hear a little bit later on tonight, um, uh, looking at everything that's happening, happening underneath these multi-species swords. The environmental aspects are hugely important these days and politically important as well for the carbon and the nitrogen economy of such systems. And obviously the end product, you know, the, the, the milk and the lamb and the beef coming off these needs to be, right. there's a question there just on mob grazing longer recover page, trampling effect. I can't see it, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So just to summarize where we're at, where, where's AFPI at in all, in all of this, this, this story um, in terms of project work, just to bring you up to speed. The EcoSward at the top of the list there is a study that's ongoing. Um, I, I'm leading that, it's in terms of uh, doing a literature review of all of the, the findings that are out there. Um, and coupled that with the on-farm study and what I forgot to put on the slide, the, the plot study um, that you saw at the Loch Ball. So that's all to do with EcoSward. There's an EIP project that uh, Jason is probably more familiar with than I, that's with farmers and that's ongoing. And it focuses on multi-species swards uh, for beef and sheep farms. 
and Denise Lowe, Dr. Denise Lowe from AFP is involved in that. We're also looking at myself and uh, John Archer and the Ag Research team. We're looking at um, lab analysis, um, trying to look at some of the sort of some of the equations for multi-species swords. We have funding in place for the 2020 samples, and we're, we're, we're currently working through those. Um, and we have the beef grazing trial, which is, uh, I think, Capra were going out onto that just this week at Hillsborough. The spades proposal, um, as the name, the, 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 the NAF name there we might suggest is about what's happening underneath the, 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 the sward. And we're looking at the soil dynamics um, under multi-species swords. That'll be at Loch Gall and at Hillsborough and on farm. Super S is a sheep grazing study at Loch Gall. But we're looking at the whole life cycle um, of the uh, sheep performance, new lamb performance, on multi-species swords, taking it right the whole way through, like I say, the whole uh, life cycle right through to the end product. And we're, we're, we're um, talking about even doing the, the uh, meat quality aspect uh, at New Forge uh, towards the end of that study. The plantain proposal is a, a dairy cow, surprise, surprise, dairy cow focused study, looking at different combinations of grass and plantain, different levels of nitrogen and how to graze them. Uh, basically at Hillsborough. Uh, and uh, another proposal there is the multi four more. That's a Dara Daffam uh, submission, looking at all those different seed mixtures, working with Chagas and other partners, um, and there'll be sites at Hillsborough on that. And finally, the bottom there, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Chan Hai at, at AFB Hillsborough is going to be looking at various animal studies across the different uh, animal types, uh, animal species, looking at multi-species uh, emissions from the animals, largely based at Hillsborough. So that's the profile of, of, of where we're at in terms of existing and proposed research. But in summary, um, these multi-species words, they, 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 they use less artificial nitrogen fertilizer, sometimes none, um, and still give respectable and, and, and competitive um, uh, amounts of, of, of yield, um, along with the, the environmental benefits that we touched on. They, they, they are more resilient to drought, and some would argue more resilient to water logging at the same time, um, because of that rooting structure, and they've got the improved soil structure as a result. Reasonable amount of evidence, I would have to say, in terms of the improved performance, at least uh, for, for, for sheep systems. And there's the added benefit of potential for improved mineral uptake. Remember back to that story about the calcium and the magnesium, the cobalt, et cetera, um, and the lower requirement for anthelmintics, which could be um, another very important um, uh, feature of these swords if it can come through and if we can keep the herbs there in the first place. Um, but these swords, like I've said, for very, very many reasons, they are, I think, more challenging. Uh, to, to, to manage. They're, 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 they're so much more variable. Um, we're all starting from a slightly different place. And the, the bottom line, I promised you I would finish with the word persistency. And that certainly is uppermost in my mind in terms of trying to set up trials to address that key problem.